All right, everybody, welcome to the webinar today. And this is a very exciting uh, when a millennial and a boomer walk into a climate meeting or a Gen Z or any of the multiple generations get together and talk about climate change. How do we do it? This is really important stuff. How do we talk about these big topics across the generations? That's what we're talking about today. And I'm joined by two very special guests who are doing some really interesting thinking into how into this issue. Um, I am very proud to introduce, starting with Anna Siegel. She's a youth activist. She's a core member of Maine Youth for Climate Justice, and she's the campaign director for Maine Youth Action. Hey, Anna, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And uh, John Hagen, the former president of Manomet Environmental Science Organization in Massachusetts, and the chair of the main climate table and executive director of our climate common. Hi, John, how are you? Hey, hi, Nick, good to see you. Thanks for the invitation. Sure. Well, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers in a minute, but I have to talk about our technical issues very quick. Um, we're gonna talk for uh, some amount of minutes and then have time for question and answers at the end. We're really hoping for sort of a free flowing discussion. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. The way to ask questions or make comments today is by putting them in, not in the chat area where we've been talking about where we're coming in from, but from the Q and A box, which is down along the bottom panel there. Um, please put your questions uh, in there. Um, we are being recorded as you probably heard a moment ago. So this will be available online uh, afterwards. And I think that's all the technical stuff I have. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to, I believe Anna is getting started. Okay. Uh, Anna, I'll go ahead and start the, start the screen share. And uh, thanks to Nick's help on how to do a new use of Zoom. Okay. Does that look good to you, Nick and, and Anna? Yeah, it looks great. That looks great. Okay, Anna, okay. Anna. Go. Awesome. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, so this is how baby boomers and Gen Z can come together for climate action uh, or anyone from across any generation. Uh, the name comes from, you know, the generations of me and John ourselves. Um, but we have managed to, you know, collaborate together, work on projects together and be colleagues and friends across that generational divide. And not only are we climate act activists and climate thinkers, but we're also birders. So that is one of the reasons I'm really glad to be doing this with Maine Audubon today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to switch slides here and uh, explain. Oh, and by the way, if anybody can't tell, I'm, I'm the older one of the two of us <laughs> today. Uh, but that, the main climate table started this project called the Intergen Climate Group uh, about a year and a half ago. And we were, um, we've always been interested in bridging sort of cultural and political divides on climate change, because our view is that everybody is going to be needed. So we might as well figure out how to talk to each other and work with each other. But in the summer of 20, hmm, 2020, I think it was, we one of our webinars was run by youth about climate justice. Uh, and it was just a great webinar that the team put together. Uh, Maine Environmental Education Association led that. And we started to think we should, we have a lot to learn from the younger generation. We should do more. And so we wrote a proposal to the Door Foundation, got a grant to form the so called Intergen Climate Group. It, it ended up being 16 people, eight younger people, eight older people. Uh, and we met monthly for a year throughout 2021. Uh, for 90 minutes every month, then our hypothesis was, could we work better, more effectively together on climate change than separately? And largely, the, I mean, not always, but uh, <laughs> mostly we are working independently of each other uh, generationally on climate change. And, yeah, you know, sometimes even adversarially, at least in the media, it's it's pitted against well, the older folks aren't doing enough and the younger you know it becomes um, more adversarial than than and that's just not healthy when we're all uh, interested in the same outcome. So we spent a year trying to learn 
if we could work effectively together and what we could do with that and how mostly how to do that. So we're going to share these lessons, some lessons learned with you today. We, we hope they're useful. Some are really obvious. Um, and then we at the end, we'd like to know from you, are there things you could do to, to put these lessons to use and work intergenerationally, maybe in ways that you hadn't thought of yet? OK, next slide. Uh, there we go. Oh, this is this is mine too. Uh, so we had uh, we've evolved a little bit because our first year's up. Some people went off to college in Scotland. No fair. Uh, so our group is evolving a little bit, uh, but we're still roughly eight people, eight younger, eight old. We're not as we're not as sober as that image looks. Most of the time, we're much happier than that. Uh, but anyway, this was our first meeting together because we met a whole year on Zoom. I mean, that wasn't our plan, but we had to. And uh, and when we finally did meet in March, just this past March, it was like we all knew each other, even though we hadn't hadn't seen each other. But many of us hadn't seen each other in person. So that was the idea. OK, Anna, I think this is yours. Yeah, so there's always been differences between the generations, uh, but today there is a sort of new tension but, uh, that has to do with our future and has, has to do with the climate crisis. Um, you know, we often say that, you know, there's this generational divide that's just natural. Uh, and, you know, we kind of just say like, it's there and we have to deal with it, but often we deal with it by ignoring it. And that should not be what we do. Okay, I'm getting used to the advancing here. So why why work intergenerationally? Um, we've talked a lot of, uh, about this with our group. Um, and obviously the one, there's one ethic, compelling ethical reason is that, you know, it's, it's mostly Anna's future ahead, not mine. And we're making decisions now in organizations like the main climate table, my organization, our climate common, you know, a lot of us who are older are in positions of decision making in some way or another, uh, government, and and shouldn't youth have a say in our decision making? It's these are, these decisions affect mostly them, so why aren't they at the table more than they are? So it's just to comp it's, you could use that for diversity of any kind uh, of reason, but especially youth because it's it's mostly their future. Um, so there's an ethical reason, but there's also a practical reason. Like Anna and I are going to talk about a project later in this presentation where I just need to know what Na I need to know what Anna knows. She just she knows things I do not know. And I know things she she doesn't. But the, the point is there are some very practical reasons to have youth a part of decision making process. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. So it's not just ethical; it's also very practical. Get things done uh, that most people maybe don't appreciate. Okay, next slide. So there are competing narratives um, between people in the media within our society, and they're counterproductive, and neither are helpful for working intergenerationally. So often, I hear as a young person from adults. I'm so sorry, my generation messed this up. You're the future, it's up to you to fix this. And often these adults mean well. They, they're, they're praising me for the work that I do or telling me that you know my generation is gonna change the world. But it shouldn't be the responsibility of young people to have that burden on our shoulders because the decision makers, you know, the adults are still, and we still need your help. And then there's also a youth narrative that I've seen with a lot of climate act, young climate activists. You caused this, just get out of our way. We need youth voice, youth power. Everything else is a distraction. Neither attitude is helpful because we need a mobilization from every sector to solve the climate crisis. We agree on that, but every sector also includes every generation. Okay, so uh, we got like, I think five lessons, major lessons that we learned that we're just gonna go through one by one with you here. And uh, the first one is <laughs> our methods of communication differ. Again, it's one of the things that seems very obvious, but we really ran into this uh, as kind of an issue. For example, I don't text. I know how to text, but I don't like to text because it just interrupts my day. 
it interrupts my thinking and I don't like to be disturbed when I'm, <laughs> but texting, I know I get that a lot of other people use texting, especially young people text, that's a primary means of communication. So I had to, okay, I guess I could text, uh, learn how to text and interact with our, our, the younger members of our group by texting, it really worked. I liked, I prefer, uh, I think a lot of people in my generation tend to prefer face-to-face one-on-one meetings. That was hard to do, been hard to do with COVID, but I, I, I don't know, I don't understand it, but I, I think we, well, we didn't have a lot of other methods when we grew up, but we're, we, we tend to be more comfortable with face-to-face real-time meetings. And, and I'm more comfortable with email. A lot of times I would send email to our, my younger group and I just wouldn't get a response. <laughs> then I would text and get an immediate response. So the, the point is we both, both of our generations realized we needed to develop our communication skills to adapt to and accommodate the other generation. Instead of just complaining about them not answering their emails, John, why don't you learn how to text? It's not that not that hard. But it is, it's seriously, it's something if you're going to work intergenerationally, you need to be aware of this and be willing to work on it. Okay, Anna. Another one of our lessons, and I believe one of our most important ones, is the ability to combine generational assets. You know, because people say, okay, so if we need to mobilize all generations and ages to work on the climate crisis, why don't youth work independently and adults work independently? What we need is to be working together because we found that the younger generation is greater passion and energy and the older generation is more pragmatic and knowledgeable. And by combining these two things, it promotes a maximization of our abilities and greatest efficacy with policy work or any sort of activism. So we all have different assets and we all have different liabilities and we can help each other through that. A really good example is that representatives um, of you know, youth representatives to the coalition, which is an adult-led coalition, main climate action now, uh, have been giving you know valuable knowledge um, and youth representation to main climate action now. And then main climate action now takes the interests of the youth and advances them in spaces where youth voice is not affirmed. So it works both ways. Um, and everyone learns in the process and we get things done. And then the next slide and, is our is our asset yeah. list. Um, so we inventoried mid-year through the process, we inventoried the respective assets of elders and youth. Uh, we felt that the most important ones were elder life experience and youth energy. Not to say that older folks can't be energetic or young people can't have life experience, but just that these are the strongest trends and assets. And there are a lot more here. Other notable ones are elders, um, tolerance for com- complexity, kind of being able to parse through like really complicated policy documents or having or being able to, you know, see, you know, the root of things, um, authority and influence already being in that position of power rather than, than having to work your way up to it. Other assets of youth are just the ability to cut through complexity, take away all the layers of bureaucracy and say, this is what we really need. This is climate justice. And then also kind of the flexibility of youth being able to shift to different modes of communication or different um, ways of doing things. And because we did our assets, of course, we had to spend a little time on our liabilities as well. So uh, I'm embarrassed to say the elders had the longer list of liabilities. (laughs) We got, we got a lot of liabilities. Uh, But, you know, some of them are obvious, like the elder group, we maybe sometimes lack passion. Uh, We didn't lack inertia. We had too much inertia. We were going in one direction and didn't know how to stop doing what we were doing. We're kind of rigid in our thinking sometimes. Um, I mean, I I think those of us, uh, you know, are as late in their career as I am, at some points you just get tired of trying to solve problem after problem after problem, and it, it can just wear you out after so much time. And then, the, you know, the you, on the youth side, um, you know, some of it is the flip side of the assets, maybe not appreciating the complexity of some of the problems we're trying to solve. Like if you pull on this thread, a bunch of other threads are going to come undone too. And you, you, it's good to know that <laughs> before, before you start, start pulling on it. And of course, the, 
the impatience because you know we want to solve the climate problem like yesterday and oh by the way we need to but sometimes we need to stop and slow down and understand the the complexity of of whatever trying to solve you know but again elders can you know we we have been operating in much the same box we've been operating in for decades that's the box we know and youth help help us see you know you guys are in a box over there <laughs> So anyway, it was useful for us to take this, you know, sort of a, a left-brained analytical approach to what we each bring to the table. Okay, Anna. Yeah, however, these assets and liabilities are not Oops. reason to not work together intergenerationally. It's not, oh, you know, the, the youth have these problems, so I don't want to work with them, or flip side. It's just something to be aware of as you approach working together and as you approach tackling problems, because each generation needs the martial the courage to seek out the other generation. You can't just wait for it. Your perfect collaboration doesn't happen. It's it, and it, you know as a miracle. It's like networking. You have to put in that effort, but at the same time, just be aware of those assets and liabilities. Know what you bring to the table and what you need to work on. Mm. Yeah, I was gonna Anna. Maybe we'll come back to part of the story. But when I first met Anna. Uh, about two years ago, I was just, I was scared to death. I mean, she was 15 years old. We, we had a bird thing going in common, but I was, you know, I was afraid I was going to say the wrong thing or something politically incorrect or just, I mean, just anyway, it, it took me a fair amount of courage to reach out to Anna and, but, but it was worth it. And uh, we'll talk more about what's, what's come of our work together in a minute but it does take a little bit of courage to reach reach across the generations yeah and i was so uh was number three we i think at some point we maybe earlier in our year we thought well you know the older folks have uh more stressors in our lives where many of us are at the peak of our career some of us are a little past the peak but we're juggling a lot with our with our jobs of you know in positions of leadership Sometimes uh, we've got elder parents who we need to help ourselves. We've got multiple things going on, but then youth have a sim not a, a different set, but stressors too. And at some point, we just began to appreciate each of us had things going on in our lives that challenged us that didn't have anything to do with climate change, and we just developed a real respect for each other, for each generation and, and what we were having to handle in our lives. And, and so we, you know, if there was any accusatory point, we just got past that and just it entered into a zone of respect for each other. But it was something we had to sort of reconcile and appreciate. Hey, uh, is this me, Anna, or is this you? No, oh, that's that's you, John and Anna, but Anna, if you could take the lead. Yeah, for sure. So there are a bunch of self-created obstacles that come with working intergenerationally. And one of them is a learned generational hierarchy. Every child is taught that their parents know best and to sit back and listen when adult figures speak, such as mentors and teachers. And it is super important to respect elders, but this learned generational hierarchy can stop us from approaching each other in an authentic way. So this leads to young activists being uncertain of their position in intergenerational spaces and worried their lack of experience means their con contributions won't be recognized as valid. So we need to be, youth need to be willing to occupy the space and learn how to yield their power and also to speak up. Because a problem that we saw in our meetings was that um, adults, the adults were talking too much in the intergen meetings. And I'll, and I'll let John talk about that. Well, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, I think it was about our eighth meeting of, of our 12 where one of the older folks said how come we're doing all the talking <laughs> in this meeting and we and we were and if you go back it was like 80 percent of the meeting it was older people talking and you know part, part of that comes naturally the older you get the more stories you have to tell the more experiences you, you have and the more comfortable you are and saying whatever's on your mind so we just we had to take a I think our ninth meeting, we said, okay, we're going to have a time out <laughs> and the young folks are going to meet together and the older folks are going to meet together and we're going to reflect on 
how we're either dominating the meeting or not speaking up in the meeting. And that helped a lot because when we came back for the next meeting, we were all much, we didn't, older folks didn't talk so much because we were conscious of what we were doing. And, and the younger folks started to step in and lean into the, to the conversation more. Um, but this is not something, I mean, this is a lesson I, it seems obvious now that, that we talk a lot as older folks, but it, if, it's good to know if you're going to work intergenerationally and you really want to hear the voice of younger people, you need to be quiet <laughs> uh, more than you're the, normally. Uh, so it's an important lesson. Okay. Now. So the secret ingredient of intergenerational collaboration is relationships. You want to know each other as people. You want to care about each other and, you know, be friends rather than just coworkers. Um, as John mentioned earlier, he was kind of scared to approach me at first about a bird study that he, um, that he was putting on in northern Maine woods, and he was going to invite me to do some research work there. I was really scared when I received his email. My first question was, oh no, does he know how old I am? I thought he, I was worried that he thought I was a graduate student and he didn't know. And then when I said yes, but told him I was 14 or 15, I'd get rejected basically. Like I wouldn't be allowed to come because that's something that's normally allowed for older folks. So I, I was scared too. But then once we got to know each other, we you know got really comfortable with each other. And now we do these presentations and we built this you know slide deck together. And it's, you know, John's a great, I consider him a mentor and figure in my life, but also a friend and, you know, on that equal level as well. So, but we learned this thing about relationships only two way, two thirds of the way through our year with Intergen. Because before we had these over-engineered meetings where we were looking at bullet points and we had a specific conversation laid out and we would get through our agenda and then we'd be done. But we didn't actually learn about each other. We just learned about, you know, opinions that others had. So once we abandoned our like over-engineered meetings that were super rigid and we just asked each other, what do you care about? You know, how's your life going? That's where relationships really started to begin. And that's where the work happened because then people realized, oh, you know, you're really interested in doing this. Let's do this as a project together. Let's take this on, let's take action. So having that relationship basis um, was super important for us. And then just as one of the, or I organized, uh the Intergen group with Katie Perry, a, a younger, a 26 year old. Um, and we had, when we set up the meetings early on, we really were scared to, we were scared of not having a conversation or a structured conversation so that people would get through 90 minutes. And that's why we had engineered them so much. And <laughs> we learned that we, sh we shouldn't have done that from the very beginning. Uh, but as Anna said, we learned soon enough at the end that, okay, let's just abandon the structure and, and have an open free ranging conversation. Um, so that the, the one thing that, um, so the relation, relationship, personal relationships matter more than anything, to me anyway, matter more than anything we've said already in this webinar. You just have to know people as people and just forget the climate issue, get to know each other. That's, and right now, the 16 or 17 of us, I truly believe we'd do anything for each other at this point, irrespective of climate, because we know each other and respect respect each other. Um, and it just took time to, to build that kind of relationship. One of the, at least to me, the one of the greatest things I heard all year might've been our last meeting when one of the younger members said, this group, the Intergen group, is the first time I worked with adults where they didn't have some kind of power over me as a parent or a, or a teacher or an employer. And I was so pleased, I hadn't thought about it that way, but I was so pleased to hear her say that because that was, that was the essence of what we were trying to create with the Intergen group so that everybody felt totally comfortable. Nobody had had any power over each, each other. and um, and apparently we, we accomplished that because that, that was Emma's take on the, on uh, sort of her summary of that, that year together. So if you're working intergenerationally, be, you know, older folks generally are in positions of power or leadership, just, just what happens when you get older, but you've got to be uh, careful in this 
intergenerational relationship not to wield that power, um, it, not, just not to wield it at all <laughs> is, is the best thing I could say about that. Yeah, because the relationships will flourish more, the trust will build more if uh, you don't, if you let go of that power. So and a great example, yeah, a great example of combining assets. So like, what does this mean in real life? Okay, sure. Like youth have energy and passion and adults have pragmatism and experience. Like those are all nice traits. But in real life, where can, where, what's an example of this happening? So not last legislative session, but the one before, um, my first legislative session, uh, there was an intergenerational coalition to push forward an extremely important bill. Um, and so this legislation was LD99, an act to divest mean from fossil fuel companies. Uh, and youth activists such as myself organized advocacy effort. We got you know it going grassroots and we got it in the public eye and in the media. And adult activists and allies worked on the technical side. They analyzed the holdings of Maine PERS, the public employee retirement system, to see how much money they had in fossil fuels. They figured out you know, the legality of different kinds of you know, bill language. And with those two skill sets and those assets, we were able to have this bill passed. And it's a huge climate bill. So this is a great real life example of how working intergenerationally helps climate projects. And so uh, our year, that Anne was talking about a project that was independent of, of our particular group, but a great example of intergen, intergenerational work. So we came to the end of our year, our grant ran out, and we said, okay, group, what do you want to do? And anything? <laughs> or do are we are we done? Is our work done here? Uh, so the, the full group wanted to continue to meet, and we are we are continuing now. We we felt like we spent all that time building trust and social capital that we'd like to do something with that now. So we pivoted into our second year, 20, 2022, and we are pivoting from talking to doing is the way we like to, to put it. So we're trying to come up with different projects, uh, you know, real world projects that work where we're working intergenerationally and getting something done. We still meet every two months and we talk about things, um, but we're, we're, we're pivoting to projects now. Um, and Anna's going to tell you about uh, maybe a couple of the next. Yeah, so one important project um, that we are taking on now is the Youth Leadership Initiative. And the goal is to place youth in positions of board and municipal leadership uh, to be decision makers at the table. Um, and so we're going to be collaborating with different folks like the Maine Environmental Education Association, hopefully various organizations to place youth on their boards, because, you know, we have a disproportionate stake in the future and we need to be at those seats of power. But there, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there is a power differential that comes with age. There are these issues of, you know, adults talking too much or youth feeling not respected in these spaces. So both boards and youth will have to be trained to work with each other to learn how to relate to each other and to communicate with one another. So that's why the goal of this project is not only just to match youth and boards or municipal positions, but also to prepare both the adults and the young person to, for that position to be filled by them. And another great project um, is the one that I mentioned earlier, the bird study. Um, lovely photo of myself, probably 5 a.m. <laughs> Um, I was very, very tired in this photo. I remember it distinctly. But here we're doing a, a point count where we're standing in the woods and we're listening for birds. Um, this is a study that uh, John has been you know, running and it happened 30 years ago and now it's being replicated 30 years later to see what, what birds have, you know, how bird populations have shifted in a changing forest and with changing climate and changing timber industry. So it's a really important study. And as you can see, it's an example of intergenerational action because John has been involving young people like me to learn both about birds and about how to be a scientist so I can grow up and do that work myself. Um, but also there is the, it, the collaboration goes both ways because now I'm working on the project as the outreach lead and I'm helping John get news about this study out into the world. Yeah. Um... So we're wrapping up here just to start to think about what you could do. Uh, um, knowing what you know now on our last 30, 
minutes or so, is there, is there are there things that you could do? Uh, I'm speaking it now to maybe the older folks on the webinar. You know, are you on, think about, are you, most of you are probably on a committee of some sort. Some of you are on boards. Um, to, you know, ask yourself, are there youth on this committee that I'm on? And if not, get them on. So <laughs> your job is to go seek, find out and get youth on that committee. You will, that your work will be enriched by it. And so will the youth. Um, and, and Anna, maybe you can speak to this too, but if you're youth on this webinar, you know, go, there's no end of things, committees and uh, decision-making bodies, big ones and little ones that you could participate in. Just show a little bit of initiative. You know, everybody needs to meet the other wherever they are. In the middle would be nice, you know, <laughs> but the, the just tremendous opportunity uh, for working intergenerationally. But we have to think about it and recognize, oh, there aren't any young people sitting around this table. I guess I should go make that happen. Uh, huge opportunity. So if you're on a committee, think about what you could do tomorrow morning, this afternoon, at one o'clock, as soon as we're done, to, to, to get that ball rolling. And anything else you want to add about that? I mean, yeah, and if that seems daunting, you know, how do I change the rules of my organization or the bylaws to allow youth? The first thing that you can do before then is just to reach out to someone. This goes for either generation. If you're a young person, if you're really passionate about music and you want to do something about music, but maybe you reach out to an older person in your community and say, hey, why don't we put on a concert to fundraise for Ukrainian refugees? And you start that collaboration, you start the conversation. Same goes for an older person wondering, you know, I really have things I'm really passionate about climate action I want to involve young people but I don't know what to do you just have to you have to take someone of your courage and reach out and so that's the first thing you can do is to start building those relationships and then also thinking about committees um, and also thinking about empowering youth movements through financial meaning, means and through your own influence if you know that there's a youth message like if you know if a youth organization has something they care about pay attention you know if means for climate justice says we really are in support of this bill and we need everyone to be focusing on this. This is really important. That's something that you can do as an adult is, you know, vote for candidates that support that bill and, you know, take action in that sense. And I, I know uh, this is our last slide, but um, uh, I think one of the, I guess maybe Anna, the, probably the thing I'm most proud of is that we published this paper in Stanford Social Innovation Review. That's, that's pretty cool. A 15 year old, I guess you were 15 at the time, and I'm 65. You know, we worked together to write this paper, this essay that got published in Stanford. So about what we learned over the last year, and it was it, number one. It was, and I saw things I would have never seen when we wrote this. I could not have written it without her, and I'd like to think she couldn't have written it out without me, but she probably could have. But it was a really good example of something else we did together. Uh, and really enjoyed working together on this. So we'll we'll end there, and uh, we're we're open to questions. We're open to you may have an idea that you'd like to bounce off of the, all of us that uh, you might ways that you might engage youth. But you know we're we're here to answer questions and just talk as as we can. Nick through uh, Q and A. Sure. Uh, yeah. And if um, first of all, thank you so much. What an interesting, awesome project that you are working on. Um, I have some questions of my own. Um, if other folks want to ask questions, please put them down below in the Q&A box. That's where they go. Um, uh, I'm interested, first of all, in the communications um, um, lessons that you learned. I'm really interested in you know, that, how there was some of those um, issues you needed to work through at the beginning. Did that also relate to how you're communicated to in terms of where different generations receive information about climate change and sort of how those uh, affect worldview or affect actions or sort of consumption of information. It does. Um, I definitely think that, for example, you know, young people are often not consuming media through uh, channel, channel television. Um, and, you know, channel television, you know, kind of public TV like CNN, um, or Fox News, as we know, you know, both 
trans television is often known for being famously biased. Uh, and I, I think that I, I like to think that young people often get a more diverse representation of media because we often get our media just from the internet, which will just throw anything at you. Um, but at the same time, algorithms and social media do tell you what you want to hear. So I think both generations can have can get like their information tailored in very specific ways and have narrow viewpoints, but just in a slightly different manner. Um, and part of what and part of what can be helpful about working intergenerationally is getting a different perspective. Oh, you only hear this? Well, I heard this about that issue. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that makes me realize that really is a bad thing. Okay, I'm glad glad that we talked about it. That sort of thing. Yeah, I don't know that I have anything to add. I don't know that this is a generational thing so much as a scientist thing. Uh, but when I see information about climate change, I usually want to go to the original research paper and see, was that true what the media <laughs> said about that? I want to know. I it is a know. scientist thing, I will tell you. It is a scientist <laughs> thing, not a, not a, but yeah, I think Anna probably has the same sure, thing sure. going. Gosh, she wants to be a scientist, but right. yeah. Um, we've got a couple of good questions in the, in the Q&A already. One from Emily, and this is a big one. Um, how, so she says, I'm interested in your thoughts about communicating climate change across generational lines to climate change skeptics. Um, is this something that you guys talked about in your sit downs or what do you We what didn't do you talk about it so much in our intergen group because um, we were trying to bridge the, this is a good question because we were, we were all the climate in group on our 16 person. So the, 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 the barrier we were trying to bridge is just generational, not right. the climate issue. We all got the climate thing. Uh, but the climate table uh, or um, chair is hosting, has hosted a series of workshops. There'll be another one tomorrow morning um, on how to talk about climate change to skeptics. And so we've, we, I've thought a lot about that. Anna, maybe you have, have too, but our, our view is that, you know, the Democrats and liberals are not enough to solve the climate problem. We need rural people, Republicans. So, you know, we might as well just go ahead and get to work on that. <laughs> and it requires, a, but, but the, now that you mentioned the question, a lot of the principles for working with climate skeptics, and I work with a lot of climate skeptics, um, is just listening. And that was in, what we ended up learning from our, inter, you know, I'm embarrassed to say, why didn't I start the Intergen project with just listening? Because that's what I do in my, the rest of my life. Um, but listening is, is key to working with skeptics or even having a conversation with skeptics. Uh, so if you want to learn more about how to do that, go to our Climate Commons website and you can register before tomorrow morning um, and, or catch the one we do in the fall. But it, it's full of uh, examples of how to talk to climate skeptics and get something done. I also think generationally with climate skeptics, um, the moral imperative often can really, you know, get them within the sense of you can, it sounds weird, you can say no to facts, you can look at a graph and say no, well, you know, like that's what climate skeptics often do, they take numbers that exist and they twist them to mean something else, um, but you can't often say not no to your own child or your own grandchild who's saying, but this, this is my future and even if you don't like those numbers, they are real. And that is what's happening right now to me. Um, and so I think that moral imperative can with, with intergenerationally can work with climate skeptics um, and not only climate skeptics, but also kind of pushing action. Uh, you know, I'll never forget there being a town council meeting. We were trying to get the city to um, pass a climate emergency resolution. And a young person walked up to the microphone and said, I don't want to have kids because of climate change. And you know, we'd had so many testimonials from a whole bunch of adults talking about the facts and how much money the city would have to spend on repairing climate damages and like, you know, how it's super important to get this, this policy passed. A young person went up there and said, you know, I don't want to have kids. It, you know, it is morally imperative for you to pass this resolution. And all the city councilors started crying and they passed it unanimously. Mm -hmm. And so that really, I mean, that that like almost a youth appeal really does something. So I, I do think there is a uh, role there for that kind of intergenerational communication to climate skeptics on both the, uh, the issue of climate itself being skeptical that exists and not wanting to take action, being reluctant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. And, and we had an anonymous attendee weigh in with, I think, um, a, a plug for a little bit of, um, you know, you, you mentioned that town meeting with some of the cause and effect on a local level. She said that that or this attendee says that that can work too, like looking at water conservation and how it will affect water bills and uh, availability for use, this person says. Um, so um, she said, or, yeah, I don't know why I'm saying she, but uh, the anonymous attendee says, I have seen people be uh, have success in getting SEPTIS involved in a climate in climate actions by looking at cause and effect on a local or personal level, such as looking at water conservation and how it will affect water bills and availability for use. So thank you for that mm -hmm. discussion. Um, a good question here for uh, I think for Anna probably from Nancy, well, but I'll of course leave it open for both of you. What are some good methods to invite high schoolers in my town of Topsom to become interested in town government committees? <clears throat> excuse me, and join the energy committee on which she serves. We have public programs online, but no youth participation yet. Yeah, Thoughts? so I think something, yeah, I think something we need to do is really analyze the structure of that case. So there's, so there's a few different things here. There's the communication of the committee itself. Are young people even aware that it's open for youth? Lots of people, we just assume that those spaces aren't for us. We assume it's not made for us. We assume that they're not welcome, that we're not welcome. And so just looking at those flyers or those, you know, however you're spreading awareness about those committees, does it say, you know, high schoolers welcome? Like, does it explicitly say ages 15 to X? Does it say, you know, you can get community service hours as a young person? Otherwise, it, we often ignore it because we just think that, oh, that's not, you know, we have to be in school right now. Like, that's not meant for us. Because that's what we're told. Like when I was first really anxious about climate change and I wanted to get involved, people told me the best thing I could do was to stay in school. And and to be clear, I I, I am in like I did stay in school. Like I am in school, I'm in school right now. But just to focus on school. And when I grew up, I could deal with it. And so that's the messaging that we often get. And so it's really important is to look at your flyers and make sure that it that you're clear that it involves youth. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, okay, so you're you've made it clear that 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 the youth can be engaged, but are your meetings actually welcome to you? Like, are they actually opening? Are they at good times for young people? Are they in the middle of the day like this? Um, or we, you know, which is often not a good time for young folks. Um, are they in the evenings? Um, if, if someone can't drive, do they have the option to zoom in? So that sort of thing. And the last one is, are you just kind of doing generic outreach to email lists that youth may not be on or you know, may not check their email or it could be ignored? So I recommend directly contacting, you know, we really value those personal relationships, to contacting a science teacher at a high school and saying, hi, you know, I'm on the town energy committee and we would love more students. You're a science teacher. Are there any students in your class who are really, you know, passionate or worried about the climate crisis? And can you connect me to them? Getting that direct communication one-on-one -on -one is really valuable and really means a lot. These youth, we love mentors. We love people to say like, you know, this is an opportunity. We can take you under a wing, you can join the energy committee rather than kind of just like seeing a flyer somewhere. So those are my thoughts there. Um, That's a great answer. But that was a little, that was a little broad and rambling. That's great. John, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, no, but I, I was going to say part of what Anna said. And if, you know, for a while I was on the conservation commission in Georgetown and, you know, why didn't I go to uh, Morse High School in Bath and give a presentation? To a class, it must have been a class that would have been interested in what the Conservation Commission is doing and invite people to to participate. It, it's just we don't, we tend not to think of these things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I could have done that. And uh, I think probably most of us could. Go, uh, Anna, can, can, if people wanted to come to a high school and give a presentation about something, is it, would we go through the principal or the, how would we Practically, who would we call to do that? Do you have a thought? I mean, often you want to go to the department chair. Um, you know, you want to say to the science teacher, like the head of the science department, uh, you know, we if, if there's space in your curriculum, we'd love to talk with you about the local impact of removing the dam from the Royal River. I just made that up. But that's a climate mm. issue that's happening in my town right now. We're looking to remove the dam. And that'd be a great thing to tell high schoolers about that directly impacts us. You know, like we swim in that river, we fish in that river, like that means a lot. So um, probably a department chair. And then, you know, engaging youth in that presentation, not just going to talk at them, but also saying, how, you know, who is interested 
um, who's interested in, uh, in helping organize this, what students would like to put on this presentation with us. And then moving forward after that presentation, not just are we telling you about the dam and the Pearl River, but are there any students who are interested in volunteering with the effort to deconstruct it, or who'd like to work on rebuilding a fish run? Um, I'm not engaged in the dam projects, so I'm kind of making up these examples, <laughs> but that is sort of the, the, the basis there. It can't just be one and done. It's not like, you know, it's about the relationships we talked about earlier. You don't just give a presentation, like, I mean, kind of like we are now, and walk away and be like, hey, we're all good now. You continue with those relationships. You remember, like, who, who was really interested in that presentation? Who can I reach out to? And, um, you know, continue building up that until you have, you know, an authentic, non-transactional relationship that leads to great action. Mm -hmm. Great, we have a few more thoughts in the in the chat about this. One, Nancy, the original question asker writes, good idea to reconnect with the local science teacher with whom I've done programs. Uh, I'm also on the regional school board, which does have two high school representatives, non-voting, but very helpful. Only recently have volunteers been able to come into the schools, right, the pandemic. Mm. Uh, uh, Bill writes, um, does the phrase all ages welcome feel inclusive or would you suggest teens and young people welcome something similar i would i would specifically say teens and young people welcome um that's just you know like i was saying earlier when i got that email from john very explicitly asking me to come and work on the study my first thought was he must have made a mistake he must think i'm a college student and you know just so you know stating that high schoolers and above or even middle schoolers i actually started doing climate work as a seventh grader and my biggest barrier to opportunities was I couldn't go to conferences because I wasn't 16 or 18. Hmm. Um, but so, yeah, that is definitely really important. And I really appreciate uh, your consideration of that question. I like that question a lot. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask now about surprises. What were the, you know, I'm sure you both had some ideas going into this, uh, you know, into the project and the sit downs about what would happen. What were you most surprised about? Uh, John, I'll start with you. Uh, we talked about it in the in the presentation. Uh, I was surprised at uh, I shouldn't have been, but I was surprised at how oblivious the older folks were on dominating our meetings. Mm. It's like I and it surprised me because we didn't even know it really. We weren't we weren't self aware enough to know what was what we were doing. And it it surprised it not only surprised me but it shocked me. Fortunately, we corrected it, you know, before it, we corrected it before the end of the first year. But that it it surprised me and shocked me because I didn't know I, I I we didn't know we were making that mistake. And so I'm glad we learned it, <laughs> and I will never forget it. That's great. Surprised, yeah, what surprised me was how valuable. Um, kind of really getting to know each other was I I kind of assumed that this whole thing would be one and done uh you know I John would invite me to the study um and then I'd go home I'd be like great that's something I'm going to put on my resume for the rest of my life uh because that's a great opportunity <laughs> and then John invited me to join the intergen project and I was like okay this is a thing that's going to happen for a year I'll just do some calls you know move on on but the intergen project's still a huge part of my life and now I'm still engaged with the bird study and you know, John and I have been talking about after the bird study, what do we do then? Are we going to create a birding trail up north? How can I be engaged in that? It, it's just, it's a self-perpetuating process. And now there's all these possibilities that keep branching out ahead of me, all from that one first contact of let's do this together. So that really surprised me. Also, what surprised me was how valuable I found the meetings. To be very honest, I was like, okay, I'm just going to sit on these hour Zoom meetings with some older folks and some younger folks and just get through it maybe do my homework on the side. Um, but that's not what they were. They were like lively, amazing discussions. You know, we talked about the different, the generational difference uh, on how we thought about nu nu nuclear power as renewable energy. Um, there was some conflict there and some great discussion generating from it. You know, we cataloged our various assets and liabilities, which was super interesting and more. So it was like really rich conversation, which was surprising. That's good. And now we start our meetings. You know, we'd start our meetings, probably spend a half an hour just going around saying, everybody, you know, what's really exciting right now that you doesn't have anything to do with climate. We don't care what it has anything to do. What's meaningful to you this month or this week? It could be something you're excited about or something you're worried about. Doesn't matter. Just tell us. Tell us. 
And so it's a, it's a, again, we're building a relationship. We get to know, we know each other as people. This is not, as Anna used the word transactional, it's not transactional anymore. It's non-transactional. And I, I think we can't emphasize enough how important just the relationship of trust hmm. is. It's really nothing new. Didn't we all know that before? Right. But we don't apply it. We don't appreciate how how powerful that that is. Anyway, yep. Anna, has this experience made you more likely to reach out to an older generation? And maybe did you learn about how to do that differently if you're going to reach out? I this this experience definitely did. Um, something a project that I'm looking at now is seeing uh, could we potentially you know divest um, from fossil fuels other main institutions like universities. And originally I would have only reached out to students, but now I'm reaching out to faculty because you know trying to see who's interested in these sorts of projects. Um, how can I connect to students? And also I guess yeah, reaching out in different ways. Uh, I'm really trying to implement more in-person one-on-one meetings because it's true I can't drive. It is convenient for me to be in person, but it inconvenient. But it is it leads to a richer and more meaningful discussion, and I think a better working relationship. Um, where it goes from being like, you know, kind of acquaintances to real colleagues. Mm -hmm. So that that's something that I've changed in response to the Intergen project. That's great. John, we talked about surprises. What about challenges? What was the hardest part of this for you? Well, it, uh, <laughs> that's interesting because I'm thinking the hardest part was keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> I, had, I had things I wanted to say and, sure. uh, you know, I, I think, you know, as I said earlier, when you've lived, you know, several decades and working in a professional situation and you run into problem after problem after problem that you've had to solve, it could be a little thing, you know, organizational thing or a bigger conservation challenge of some sort. You can't, after making decades of mistakes, you can't help but learn that doesn't work. <laughs> if you want to tell the younger folks, that's not going to work. But then you have to be careful and remember that, you know, maybe that's because I've been my box and I just haven't thought about it differently. Um, but that, that was a, that's been a challenge to just stay quiet and, and listen. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. We can all learn. Anna, did you have a big challenge? I think, I think it can be challenging for me to remember um that well I'm sorry I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this I think it can, it can be challenging for me to remember um that you know folks have probably gone through these situations before like you know we we that that we've you know climate action isn't new and we've been doing this for years um and that it's really important to lean on the older generation and say like you know what have you already worked on what was successful what wasn't because you don't want to make those same mistakes and so that's been a challenge for me to remember and to take, take into action. I also wanted to flag for attendees that um, the, the article that we referenced briefly at the end of our presentation, which is a synthesis of all these lessons, I put it in the chat um, a few minutes ago. And if you, you know, weren't able to take notes or you're not a note taker, but you want to remember this later, almost everything we said was in that article, just in a less interactive and less fun format. <laughs> um, but it's, it's still a nice read. So if that is of interest and you want to save this for later or share it around um, and you don't want to look at the recording of this meeting, you can also check that out. Excellent. And I've also put the websites for Our Climate Common and the Maine Youth for Climate Justice in the chat. Those are ways, I assume, you can reach out to both John and Anna. There may be other ways as well. Um, for follow-ups or to get involved, it'd be great. You know, Nancy, if you want to, uh, and others, you want to get uh, some youth into the town committees uh, that's awesome and so and so let's act now um, we're bringing it in right on time I want to thank John and Anna so much for your participation this has been the work you do is fascinating um, and uh, I, I thank you for tackling it um, I want to say quickly before people jump off is that um, this is part of a series of three webinars that we are hosting with uh, Grossmart Maine our uh, next week the 26th our final presentation, same time, Thursday at noon, uh, we'll be hosting a webinar called Saving Money and the Planet, which will have Revision Energy and Efficiency Maine 
on to talk about all the ways that uh, all the rebates available for um, for weatherization or electronic or electric vehicles or uh, solar, all the ways that you can save money and do your part to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So please join us for that. I should have the link handy, but I do not. So it's on the uh, main Audubon website. Again, I want to thank, thank John and I want to thank Anna for your participation and thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Nick. Have a Bye. good day. Bye, Bye. everybody.